Will all radiotherapy be delivered in maximum five treatment sessions? Dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, and dear friends, um, starting with this provocative question, it's a pleasure to open this virtual symposium nicknamed Five Times Five. My name is Matthias Guckenberger, um, and I warmly welcome you in the name of the University of Zurich, the University Hospital of Zurich, and its comprehensive cancer center. So how do I move forward here? Okay, the radiobiological effects of distributing radiation over a longer period of time have been first described more than 100 years ago. And fractionation of radiation achieves a differential effect between cancer cells and normal tissue and thereby allows curative treatment intent by dose escalation. This is very well known and something we are practicing on a daily basis. As a consequence, curative radiotherapy has been practiced for decades with weeks long conventionally fractionated radiotherapy, whereas palliative radiotherapy was mostly practiced in a hyperfractionated fashion. You can call it even extreme hyperfractionation. And this fundamental radiobiological principle of fractionation is today still true without any question. However, oncology in general and also radiation oncology have changed. Precision radiotherapy has been achieved by physical sparing, by rapid advances in technology. We have a much better understanding of radiobiology today. And in parallel, precision oncology today allows for comprehensive cancer characterization. Immunotherapy and targeted drugs have become standard of care and new multimodality treatment concepts are practiced based on interdisciplinary exchange. We are therefore confronted with the question whether the effects of fractionation maintain their value and whether or whether they become irrelevant in today's area of cancer care. Hyperfractionation, of course, is at the heart of our discipline of radiation oncology. It affects acute and late toxicity, local efficacy of our treatment, quality of life of our patients. We are discussing immune effects and of course, it has implications on reimbursement. However, the effects of hyperfractionation, they reach well beyond our discipline and also involve surgical disciplines, optimal combination strategies, the choice of the optimal local treatment modality. It affects our colleagues from medical oncology, how to integrate local and systemic therapy. How about the optimal sequencing? Our patients will be affected, integration into daily life, acceptance by our patients, compliance, and of course, it also affects our society in terms of healthcare resources. Extreme hyperfractionation, it is therefore an opportunity, but simultaneously a risk and threat. And this graphic here illustrates common psychological response mechanisms to change. And to my understanding, fighting, just facing it, flighting or freezing, they are inappropriate for such a relevant clinical question. An academic response calls for a thorough data analysis, a balanced data interpretation, and an open discussion. And that's what we aim for with this symposium called Five by Five. The symposium, it will be fractionated into five weekly mini symposia, each starting at 5 p.m. and lasting for 55 minutes if we stay on time. Five keynote speakers will discuss the current status of extreme hyperfractionation for five tumor entities, rectal cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and lung cancer. Today, we will start with rectal cancer. We have selected this cancer because of the decades long and parallel developments in conventionally fractionated radiochemotherapy and in short course radiotherapy, both ending in total neoadjuvant treatment concepts. Despite several comparative trials have been conducted, we still have only insufficient criteria for or against the other treatment strategy. With this, I'm very proud and honored to announce and introduce our esteemed faculty. Our keynote speaker today is well known to everyone in the field of GI oncology and rectal cancer in particular, Professor Klaus Rödel, Chairman of the Department of Radiation Oncology at the University Hospital of Frankfurt. 
describing all his achievements and would require a dedicated symposium. So I will keep this short. Professor Rödel serves as clinical director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center in Frankfurt. He's speaker of the German Erector Cancer Study Group, where he has led and is leading numerous phase one, phase two, and phase three trials, all optimizing chemo radiotherapy for rectal cancer and other GI malignancies. His scientific work has been awarded nationally and internationally, for example, just recently with the Astro Brewer Award. Professor Rödel will be followed by a presentation from Dr. Panos Balampas, senior clinician at our radiation and oncology department in Zurich, who was actually trained by Professor Rödel. Before we will start some housekeeping um, um, rules, first I would like to thank Degro and Estro for accreditation. I would like to thank Industry, Varian and Murray for their participation, for their support. CME credits will be sent to you via email and please use the chat functionality, the question and answer functionality to make that an interactive experience. With that, Klaus, many thanks for joining our symposium and being the first one presenting in this five times five symposium. Klaus, the floor is yours. So Matthias, Panos, colleagues from Switzerland, probably from Europe and even around the world. Uh, thank you very much for this flattering invitation uh, and introduction, Matthias. It's really a pleasure to be the first keynote speaker for this excellent symposium on five times five. And today we start with rectal cancer, as um, Matthias said, this is really a decade long journey between five times five and long course radio chemotherapy. And so I don't have any conflict of interest. I need to announce that, yes, indeed, I, I have been involved in many trials that try to optimize chemo radiation rather than five times five, but with the new data now, um, been published, been presented at ASCO meetings with, uh, with five times five. We, we live in exciting days and maybe we have to reassess uh, the concept of five times five of long course radio chemotherapy and, and how we should incorporate these radiotherapy concepts into multimodality treatment, including total neo-German treatment. So to start with historically, where do we come from? Uh, you, you are probably all aware that there have been basically two main paradigms around the world. The first one has been mainly established in the northern part of Europe, in Sweden, in, in, in the Netherlands, and applied five times five with immediate surgery uh, to all rectal cancers, including those early uh, stage one tumors. And surgery was applied let's say on, on Monday, when the last fraction of radiotherapy was given on, on Friday. And in the mid part of Europe, in, in the southern parts of Europe, uh, in the United States, a different concept has been developed, which was restricted to locally advanced tumors. So we tried to avoid uh, to irradiate early tumors, T1, T2 tumors. It was mainly restricted to locally advanced T3, T4 or N plus tumors. And this was based on five of your Cape Cytobine chemo radiotherapy alone, and then surgery was postponed approximately six weeks after completion of chemo rad. And, and to wrap up, all, all trials in one slide have been conducted with these two concepts. By the way, all have been, have been conducted in Europe, nothing in the US, in Sweden, in, in, in Netherlands, in British, in German, in French. Uh, all these trials were very consistent in showing that local control is significantly increased either by five times five and immediate surgery or by pre-op chemo rat uh, versus post-op chemo rat or versus post-op pre-op or versus pre-op radiotherapy alone. So you can say by and large with five times five or with chemo rat, the local relapse rate was cut to half. Um, compared to the uh, standard treatment surgery alone or radiotherapy alone or post-op chemo rat. Very few of these trials showed a improvement in disease-free or overall survival, particularly the Swedish trial, which was, however, conducted in the pre-TME area where local control was poor after surgery alone, 
and with five times five, this was tremendously improved. And this would probably be the, the reason why the Swedish trial was positive for overall survival. While all the other more modern trials performed in the TME era were negative uh, with respect to overall survival. Subsequently, we have two trials, which I want to briefly wrap up that directly compared both paradigms, so five times five and immediate surgery versus uh, a five of you based chemo radiotherapy. It was a Polish trial or the first one. And this trial included patients with low T3, T4 tumors based on clinical examination. And the primary endpoint of the Polish trial was not was not local control or, or long-term long clinical outcome, but sphincter preservation in an uh, effort to improve downsizing by chemoradiotherapy and the hypothesis was that this should end up in more sphincter preservation. And the Australian trans Dasman trial was a more recent trial. Uh, the inclusion criteria were based on endorectal ultrasound or MRI. T3 or any uh, lymph node involvement. And the primary endpoint here was local recurrences. However, you see here 10% difference was assumed between those concepts. And given the fact that with surgery alone, you should not be higher than 10% local failure rates. I think this was a very ambitious trial to show a 10% difference between both concepts. Just to wrap up shortly the results from the Polish trial, of course, there was less toxicity with five times five. However, there was more PCR uh, pathological complete response and, and less uh, involvement of the circumferential resection margin with radio chemotherapy and a longer interval to surgery. And by these are kind of surrogate endpoints and one would have predicted in those times that this should translate in better long-term outcome, but this was not true local recurrences or survival and all other endpoints were equal. Interestingly, sphincter preservation, the primary endpoint has not been improved with uh, chemo radiotherapy and this trial was criticized that of course sphincter preservation is a surgical concept and if the surgeon is not willing to change his mind from first assessment of the tumor and after downsizing of the tumor to change his operative strategy, then obviously there will no increase in sphincter preservation. This was a main criticism of the Polish trial. And the trans Tasman trial was showed very similar results. Again, more acute toxicity, obviously with chemorad, but again, more PCR, no sphincter preservation improvement. There was a slight improvement in local control, but it was not significant with chemoradiotherapy subgroup analysis indicated that uh, chemorad should be especially uh, advantageous in low-lying tumors, but still this was not significant. And no uh, other long-term oncological endpoints were different, including long-term toxicity. So, when we consider all these trials, let's think about what are the present challenges and what are the strategies. And, and this might be nicely illustrated by the 10 year results of our German trial of pre op versus post op chemo red. And, and on the left panel, you see that the local failure rate now after, after five years is in the range of 5% only, which is excellent considering the former historical. Uh, local failure rates up to 30-40%, but with pre-op radio therapy or, or, or chemo radio therapy, five times five, whatever you do, you will end up in a local failure rate of only 5%. The problem in rectal cancer obviously still is that distant metastases are not adequately addressed. Um, as high as 30% of all these patients in the German rectal cancer study did, uh, uh, did have uh, distant metastases during the course of the treatment. And obviously this is the main reason behind the finding that I showed you on the first slide that there is no improvement in disease-free survival or overall survival with this concept. And always when you have such a situation, not only in rectal cancer, this applies to many other tumor entities as well. When you have an excellent local control with multimodal treatment, but uh, poor distant control, then you have at the same time 
de-escalating strategies and escalating strategies. And obviously, the local de-escalating strategies refer to radiotherapy. So we now have to confront ourselves. Do we irradiate the right patients? Obviously, stage one tumors, like in the first trials of five times five, uh, have been excluded in almost all guidelines around the world, should not be irradiated. Uh, and now with MRI criteria, we have much more uh, information of the tumor before we start treatment. And for example, one of these issues is whether the mesorectal fascia is involved by the tumor. And there are some surgeons, and they have good reasons to argue in this way, that only patients that will have this uh, lateral involvement of the mesorectal fascia do need preoperative treatment. This is one area of research. And at the same time, we have learned by applying this pre-op five times five, this pre-op radiochemotherapy that at least a certain percentage of tumors do respond excellently. They are disappearing. Uh, we have a PCR rate around 10% to 20% with five times five and waiting longer or with chemo rate and waiting longer to surgery. And obviously now we discuss whether we can select and identify these patients and apply a wait and see strategy for those patients. So we de-escalate surgery. And the escalating strategies obviously refer to more and effective uh, systemic chemotherapy, asking whether 5-FU or CAPE therapy alone is the right uh, form uh, of, of uh, concurrent chemotherapy and uh, as well as adjuvant or induction chemotherapy. And we are now confronted with exciting new data on, on induction uh, chemotherapy and consolidation chemotherapy for surgery, known as now as total neoturgent treatment. And obviously, we have to ask us whether chemotherapy is the right way to go or what is the role of newer drugs like targeted agents or even immunotherapy. Obviously, in my talk, I will not address all of these issues, but I will primarily uh, ask what have the, the two concepts that I have alluded to you at the beginning uh, developed from their start. So let's start with five times five. Now, five times five has traditionally been applied with immediate surgery, and now there are some trials out there that uh, try to delay surgery. And what happens? And is it more toxic? Is it more effective? The, the other area of research is can we apply five times five and delay uh, surgery, in this, in this case local excision, to increase organ preservation. This will not be uh, covered by my talk, but by Pano's talk. And obviously with more recent data, we can ask if it's, if it's possible and if it's uh, rational to postpone radiotherapy after five times five, can we use a prolonged interval for applying more chemotherapy. And this is TNT. And I will briefly present the main and most important trials addressing this question. The first trial was delayed surgery after five times five. This was a Stockholm three trial performed still in, in any rect resectable rectal cancer, including stage mm -hmm. one tumors. And here you see uh, the, the basic concept should we wait longer, four to eight weeks after five times five. There was a third arm uh, referring to uh, conventionally fractionated radiotherapy without chemotherapy, which was not standard of care in those times, but still was applied here in the Stockholm 3 trial. And here are the results. There was, by the way, a two arm randomization for those who would not be willing to apply a long course radiotherapy. So, more of the uh, contributing centers randomized their patients in the two-arm randomization. And as you can see here, this is possible. There is, there is no increase in any local recurrence rates with the delayed approach, uh, nor in distant metastases. Interesting post-op complications uh, are significantly lower when you wait longer. This was not clear at the beginning. It could have happened that with, with more fibrosis, most of complications would increase, but this was not the case. Uh, they were even significantly lower. And also we learned that if you wait longer after five times five, of course, then you have more tumor regression, ending up in more PCR rate, more YPT zero tumors. On the other side, 
If you do not operate immediately after five times five, you will end up in more acute toxicity simply because you have the time to experience acute toxicity. If the rectum is not removed immediately by surgery, then there is obviously some toxicity after five times five. Um, and um, interestingly, as again to the post-op complications, why are they increased after immediate surgery? Uh, my hypothesis is that you add up both complications after surgical, so typical surgical complications, and those that appear one or two weeks after, ra after radiotherapy, and then you'll end up with more post-op complications if you operate immediately on. But still, the Stockholm 3 trial showed elegantly that, it's, uh, that it may be even advantageous to wait longer after five times five. So this was then used uh, in a new concept. And the first trial that did so was a Polish two trial. In this trial now five times five and the experimental arm uh, was delayed for 12 weeks before surgery was applied. And the time interval between end of radiotherapy and surgery was used for three cycles of combination chemotherapy, in this case, Volvox 4. And this was compared to standard radio chemotherapy. However, note that the concurrent chemotherapy was a little bit strange in this trial. It used bolus by the view, which is not recommended in our modern trials. And there was partly a, a, a weekly oxaliplatin schedule, which I do not completely understand because oxaliplatin was also given without any 5 view modulation during weeks two, three, and four. And this was abandoned after the phase three trials of oxaliplatin with chemo radiotherapy were not convincing. And so they abandoned the oxaliplatin regimen. But by and large, this was a chemo radiotherapy mm -hmm. uh, concept uh, uh, randomized against the TNT concept with five times five and Folfox. And the results of this trial were as follows. The primary endpoint was R0 resection rate. Note the inclusion criteria of this trial were so-called unresectable. I don't know what really this is unresectable, but there were unresectable T4, there were fixed T3 tumors, so probably very advanced tumors. And so the primary endpoint R0 resection rate was, was, was justified. And there was a certain in increase with TNT, but it was not significant. And with all other endpoints, including PCR, including toxicity and, com and complications, there was no, not, not, a, not a significant difference. And with long-term follow-up, indeed, there is also no difference in local uh, failure and metastasis rate. And with long-term follow-up, uh, there was no increase in overall survival. Note, there was a, there was a signal of a improved overall survival with, with shorter follow-up, but this vanished away with longer follow-up. So probably it was an artifact and there is no real difference between uh, long-term endpoints in this Polish two trial. So if you want the, the uh, this was a negative trial for TNT, uh, five times five with Paul Fox uh, was not superior as anticipated in this trial with respect to R0 resection rate. And so it was uh, commended as a negative trial. But this changed now with the Rapido trial. And I think the Rapido trial is obviously much better designed than the Polish trial has included much more patients. It's based on, on clear inclusion criteria on MRI based high risk features. So I really think this is an excellent design trial. Note this, the, the inclusion criteria are really ugly tumors. So T4 tumors, those who um, involves in mesorectal pastia or with extended lymph node involvement or with enlarged uh, extra mesorectal lateral lymph nodes or with extramural venous invasion. This is an MRI feature that is associated both with local uh, failure and distal metastasis. So very, very good and clear inclusion criteria. And the concept here in the control arm is very well taken. It's, it's capecitamine-based radiochemotherapy in normal fractionation, so stand-of-the-art stand uh, radio chemotherapy, they wait eight weeks before TME. And then there is option on adjuvant chemotherapy. This was, it was criticized in some comments in the Lancet Oncology paper because this paper was recently published in Lancet Oncology. But I think it's very well taken because uh, we don't know whether adjuvant chemotherapy really improves. Many trials are negative that tested adjuvant chemotherapy after radio chemotherapy. 
And for example, in our German guidelines, we are opt for the same. This is optional because there are no good data to justify adjuvant chemotherapy after radio chemotherapy and surgery. So a pragmatic approach, it is standard of care in, in, uh, in, in many countries, including that adjuvant chemotherapy is optional. I would not criticize that. Uh, indeed, I would, I would argue that this is a very pragmatic and straightforward approach. And then the experimental arm, we have this five times five. And then we have um, a really long and, and, and aggressive chemotherapy, without a doubt. So six cycles of KPOX or nine cycles of Folfox for a total of 18 weeks. Um, and so uh, the final assessment of tumor response and surgery takes place 22 or 24 weeks after start of treatment. So meanwhile, with total near German treatment, we have a period of half a year before the surgery takes place. The primary endpoint here was more or less disease-free survival. It has been criticized, this, this endpoint, it's uh, disease-related treatment failure. I will uh, shortly announce which events were included to define this endpoint. And there was the hypothesis that uh, with, with uh, five times five and more extensive chemotherapy, this uh, primary endpoint would increase in the experimental arm. And here are the first results. It is a large trial, more than from, of 800 patients, with respect to early efficacy parameters that can be detected in surgical and pathological uh, data and specimen. You see that there is no improvement in, in, in the avoidance of stoma surgery, so abdominal resection in the same magnitude. It's interesting, so that the uh, quality of the mesorectal plane is a little bit worse in the TNT arm. This is even significant uh, worse. Uh, and it may be associated with, a, with an endpoint that I will show you uh, in a second, the local failure rate. But we have to note that, that there, was an, there was a problem, obviously, with, uh, in, in some patients at least, uh, with a optimal mesorectal plane of surgery. No increased post-operative complications, no increased post-op death. The early efficacy endpoints like R0 resection, CRM positive are very similar in both the trials. Uh, and interestingly, um, the pathological complete response rate has been almost doubled with TND. But note, uh, the time point of uh, operation after pre-op radio chemotherapy is only eight weeks. And in this trial, it's 22. So simply waiting longer will increase the PCR rate. So uh, this, this, this surrogate endpoint PCR will not um, necessi necessarily uh, be associated with improved uh, long-term endpoints because it could be expected that PCR rates will increase by simply waiting longer. But this, this this data clearly show that it's feasible. There is no increase in a surgical problem, in problems and complications and long, uh, while waiting longer with one, with one uh, exception, and this is a mesorectal plane, uh, the quality of surgery. And here are the, 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 the results of the primary endpoint. Note that the disease-related treatment failure was defined as any distant metastasis, any local regional failure, any new primary colorectal cancer and any treatment related death. So I think it's, it's an adequate endpoint. Uh, the authors also uh, analyzed different endpoints in their recent paper. And, uh, the, the, the message was, was uh, the same in all endpoint definitions. And I think it's an adequate endpoint. And you see here, uh, there is a significant increase in the endpoint um, of disease-related uh, treatment failure. And this is mainly caused, obviously, by a better control of distant metastases. And I show you, this is the challenge now. We have to, we have to cope with uh, distant metastases. And this is all the first trial, indeed, now that really uh, showed a significant improvement in control of distant metastases. It is not true for local failure rate. So it's not a significant difference, but there is a certain trend that uh, TNT with five times five is associated with more local failure rates. It's not significant, we have to clearly state that, but uh, it should be noted 
and it may be associated with a more effective chemoradiotherapy schedule or with the problems in TME surgery that I alluded to you earlier. Obviously, with this short follow-up time, no difference in overall survival. So these were the, the pivotal trials for five times five, and I would briefly like to address all of these uh, mo most modern trials of chemoradiotherapy. And as I, as I also already uh, introduced, I will not talk about any of these new, new tr uh, uh, trials, especially I will not uh, refer to the issue of uh, oxaliplatin during a radio chemotherapy and targeted agent is, is beyond the scope of this, uh, of this um, uh, report. So the first trial of TNT in, with long course radio chemotherapy has been a small Spanish trial, a randomized phase two trial. And this is really TNT at its best. So induction chemotherapy with K-box followed by radio chemotherapy. And this was tested against standard of care, radio chemotherapy here with oxaliplatin and adjuvant chemotherapy. And this was a small trial and showed nicely that obviously compliance is much better with induction chemotherapy. I mean, we all know that adjuvant chemotherapy is, is not easy to apply after chemo red and uh, surgery. So obviously much better because it's less toxic. Um, so th this is as expected, but you have to show it in a trial. In this small trial with only 50 patients in both arms, there was no difference in PCR rates and no difference in, in disease-free survival. So the next trial that has been published recently is the PRODIGY 23 trial. Uh, the inclusion criteria of this, of this trial are not as strict as the RAPIDO trial, so T3 at risk for local recurrence is T4. And this was basically a trial of induction chemotherapy with a aggressive regimen again, so three months of, of fulfurinox before radio chemotherapy. And again, this was uh, tested again what we consider standard of care radio chemotherapy. And here again, uh, the second trial that showed that there is a improvement with more, with more chemotherapy applied in the neurochurvent setting. Again, a, a significant improvement in disease free survival. And again, this was based on a better control of distant metastases with no differences in local control. And as by now, no differences in overall survival. So when we now wrap up all these uh, trials, then we have the RAPIDO trial and the Polish trial which started with radiotherapy, five times five. And then we have the positive uh, results of the PRODIGY 23 trial which started with induction chemotherapy. And our trial in Germany asked the question, what is the optimal sequence for TNT? We, we don't know that at the moment. So should we start with induction chemotherapy followed by radio, radio chemotherapy or the other way around? Should we start with radio chemotherapy as in, as in Rapido? It was done with 5 to 5, but it started with local treatment and then wait longer to surgery and use that for consolidation chemotherapy. Basically, this is a sequence trial. All the treatment modalities are identical but the sequence has been altered. And the results have also been published recently. And I, I think they, are, they help to, to assess this whole concept uh, nicely because uh, we all know that, that compliance to radio, radio chemotherapy is a pivotal point. And uh, what, what impact do, have, do, do the respective treatment components have on compliance? And obviously, if you start with induction chemotherapy, then there is a problem with compliance of radiotherapy. You will end up with only 90% of patients receiving full dose of radiotherapy uh, versus almost 100% with chemo radiotherapy when you start with, with local treatment. And the other way around, if you, uh, if you start with induction chemotherapy, you have a better compliance and you lose some chemotherapy if you apply consolidation chemotherapy after, after local treatment. The primary endpoint of our trial was PCR. Um, and it was improved significantly with the uh, sequence chemo red versus uh, induction chemotherapy. Again, probably due to the longer interval between completion of radio chemotherapy and surgery. And again, we showed that there is no problem with surgery. So the Clavian Tinto classification is a surgical complication uh, classification. And you see that waiting longer after local treatment does not increase um, morbidity, post-op complications, it can be safely applied after a longer interval. 
And the Oprah trial indeed is a very similar trial to our German trial. Again, ask the question, induction versus consolidation chemotherapy. But this Oprah trial includes a very important point, uh, and that is a restaging after completion of, of TNT and then stratification. If you have complete response in this trial, it was open for a non-operative management, meaning organ preservation. And only if there was residual tumor after TNT, then radical surgery was required. And the results have not yet been published, but presented at the ASCO meeting, ASCO GI meeting earlier this, this year. And I, I really was really astonished about these data. I mean, the disease free survival is the same in both uh, sequences. I would have expected that. Um, and distant metastasis is equal. So probably when you reduce the compliance to consolidation chemotherapy, this does not translate in any uh, deterioration of uh, distant metastasis free survival. And now you have, after three years, a TME free survival, so organ preservation in the range of 60%. And this is really astonishingly high. Note there were the patient inclusion criteria were stage two and stage three, the classical inclusion criteria. And 60% of all these patients end up with a TME free survival after three years with the sequence chemo radiation and consolidation chemotherapy. Really impressive data. So I presented all these starters to you on TNT with five times five and radio chemotherapy and, and, and obviously uh, uh, trials answer some questions and they uh, induce more questions. And this is particularly true here with, with all these uh, trials. First question is which patient now really should receive total neurogen treatment? Should we apply to the very well-defined Rapido criteria only? And is a, is a T3 tumor in the mid part of the rectum not a candidate for TNT because it can easily be managed anyway? So which patient should receive TNT? Should be short course radiotherapy? Note the Polish trial was negative. The, the, the Rapido trial was positive. And we have, we have three trials with chemo radiotherapy. It's the Oprah trial, the Protégé trial, and our German trial. So if the data here is so clear that Rapido is superior to everything else, we have two, we have two trials with five times five. One is positive, one is negative. And we have three trials for chemo radiotherapy. When it comes to the TNT sequence, should we use induction chemotherapy or consolidation chemotherapy? It's not yet solved this problem, but I think the OPRA trial in the US and our German trial rather speak or propose to prefer a radio chemotherapy upfront and then consolidation chemotherapy. The question is how many chemo is required? I mean, Rapido is really an aggressive regimen. Can this be tolerated by most of our patients? Nine cycles of full box. And with the ever, ever increasing response rate with total neurogen treatment, is this whole concept now ready to use for organ preservation? And not all of these questions, but some of those will probably be answered uh, by our ongoing German trial. It's my last slide. I just wanna briefly introduce to you our ongoing German trial. The inclusion criteria are very well taken again, I think, with MRI-based uh, tumors. And we include any T3 of lower rectal cancer in this trial and, and otherwise in mid-rectal cancer, they should be uh, advanced tumors. And the primary endpoint here again now is, is organ preservation because we don't have any reason to assume that any of these regimen will have a worse or better disease-free survival, but it could be, and this is our hypothesis, that by optimizing a radio chemotherapy with a slightly increased dose and with optimized concurrent chemotherapy, that may be even more efficacious than five times five with respect not to local control, not to distant metastases, but to organ preservation. And this is the final endpoint, the primary endpoint of our trial. So with this, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Klaus, for this excellent presentation and comprehensive overview. I would start with the first question about patient selection for 5 by 5 um, mm -hmm. Traditionally, we have used it for, um, as I said, mid-rectum um, T2, T3 tumors. 
has that changed with Rapido in your practice? Let's say I, I, I'm a fan and I'm an admirer of the Rapido trial. I, I indicated at the beginning that I was not a representative of five times five, uh, but the Rapido trial is an excellent trial. And I think it was very well taken to use this concept for ugly tumors, for locally advanced tumors. I mean, T4 is, is very clear that we should have an, uh, this, ex, this, this aggressive regimen, we need that. And, but also for, for extensive lymph node involvement, we know that this is a risk factor for local, for local failures and for distant metastases. So in my opinion, if a patient is fit to tolerate, to tolerate uh, the, the Rapido this, uh, regimen, should not be too old indeed, should not be beyond 80 years, should not have too many comorbidities, then I would regard the five times five and chemo rat according to Rapido as maybe not the standard of care, but a very good option to, to use. And we had in Germany, we had a recent discussion obviously with, with all these a question and there was a, a consensus statement from the medical oncologists, radiation oncologists and surgeons that, that confirmed that with this new data, uh, Rapido or let's say TNT in which form ever is an option that can be used. I'm skeptical that any patients need this uh, aggressive form of, uh, of chemotherapy uh, indeed. I would be skeptical that, that people with comorbidities or older patients will tolerate the concept. But if you select patients adequately, then it is a good concept. We have a couple of questions in the chat and we um, please use the chat functionality or the um, question and answers. Um, we try to address a couple of them, but there's most likely too many and we will try to address them afterwards. One question is, would you apply TNT for patients with oligo M1. So let's assume a node positive T3 rectal cancer, but with a solitary liver metastasis. Would you prefer Rapido or Prodige? Is there any evidence which supports such a procedure? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. And indeed, I, I, I use this Rapido design regimen in this particular case since, since years, because there was a, there was, there were an earlier M1 trial with five times five and then consolidation chemotherapy with Volfox in this case with, with the addition of Bevacizumab and uh, this was done in M1 patients. So in this, in this scenario where you, have, where you have distant metastases, I think it's a very wise regimen because you have short radiotherapy and then you open up plenty of times for, for adequate systemic treatment. And this is particularly important if you have distant metastases, obviously. And if they are resectable, and they are and the liver metastases have been considered by the surgeon to be resectable, uh, but need some neogenic chemotherapy, I think it's an ideal uh, regimen. And I use it personally since, since years because I consider it as very, very appropriate in this scenario. So yes, yeah. I would use it in this scenario for me, the best data coming from Rapido or Rapido-like regimens. Whether or not the Folfirinox, according to the Protégé, is adequate in this sense as well, we don't know. Uh, but I think we have better data and we have more rational to use Rapido-like designs in the case of uh, oligometastatic metastatic disease. Another question which was asked a couple of um, different ways. How do you adapt or do you adapt target volumes? Do you adapt treatment technique between conventionally fractional and five by five? If we remember the early trials, it was AAP, APPA, particularly the Stockholm trials, but I guess today it's all intensity modulated, but also target volumes. Do you adapt in terms of fractionation or is it similar, identical in your trial? Yeah, you don't adapt with five times five, obviously. There is no tumor regression uh, during that. And we do adapt during chemo radiotherapy. In our new trial, we have 45 grade to the larger volume. And then we make a cone down uh, boost to the uh, residual tumor as assessed after restaging in the fifth treatment week. You can apply a simultaneous integrated boost as well if you want right from the beginning. But uh, the basic concept here is to adopt the uh, boost dose to a shrinking tumor vo uh, volume uh, during a radiotherapy. Note the dose in our trial is, is not a 40, uh, 50 gray, but 40, 50, uh, 40, 
45 grade, indeed. So a little bit higher. And this is uh, similar to the OPRA trial. There's one question in the audience what uh, dose the OPRA trial used. And this was 45 grade, indeed. A little higher external beam radio, uh, radiotherapy dose. And I think we should use all our optimized techniques in radiotherapy. Uh, in these concepts, because we can uh, we can calm down uh, the treatment volume easily after five weeks. Maybe one last question before we move um, to um, Panos as the last speaker. Um, outside of the current um, ARO trial, what should be recommended to a CT3 CN positive cancer in the lower third of the rectum in an elderly patient? Yeah, elderly patient, elderly and frail patients, I would recommend five times five and waiting longer. So not immediate surgery, uh, waiting at least eight weeks. Or if this patient tolerates Cape cytopene or 5-FU infusional radiotherapy, I would apply um, classical and chemo red with Cape cytopene. Both concepts uh, could be used in this scenario. If, if a patient is not uh, uh, that does not tolerate chemotherapy, we always apply five times five and wait eight to 10 weeks. Okay, um, we would love to have more, more and even longer discussion, but also looking on the time. Um, thank you, Klaus, for this excellent presentation and for the very um, well brought discussion we had. With that, I would like to hand over to um, Dr. Palampas um, from our department. And you have heard the issue of, well, we see now seeing a much higher rate of pathological or clinical complete response. We've seen um, much higher rates of organ preservation. So might that be a way to increase organ preservation by total neoadjuvant treatment, and maybe also by intensification of the radiation component, not by de-intensification? Panas, the floor is yours. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for staying as late and for the numerous participation today. After Professor Erdel uh, gave this uh, perfect description of different fractionation regimes with focus on neoadjuvant treatment, uh, we'll focus on the organ preservation a strategy which is uh, very, actually very much followed in last years in rectal cancer. Uh, first of all, uh, what is a watch and wait strategy? How did it start? Historically then, uh, trials based on the intended organ preservation and some concepts to improve the rates of organ preservation. Let's start with this historical or accidental data. Why they are called accidental data? Because actually the landmark study that many of you know of Habergama from Brazil was um, a neoadjuvant regime of uh, 50 gray and uh, two cycles of moderately dosed five of you. And it resulted already in a very good complete remission rate of 34% after six to eight weeks. Of course, there were also T2 tumors included, uh, so not only um, advanced tumors, but the very interesting finding of this trial was that after one year of close follow-up, including endoscopy, mm -hmm. tumor markers, et cetera, the vast majority of these patients, around one third uh, of the total number, uh, remained in the stage zero. That means they sustained a complete remission without regrowth. Uh, based on that data, the Brazilian group uh, consulted a study, um, conducted a study with slightly escalated radiotherapy dose 54 gray, uh, together with six cycles of five with few chemotherapy. And that was enough to double the rate of complete remissions and accordingly to also double the rate of state zero after one year. What are he, the differences here? Not only the escalation, but also the longer waiting, maybe, for a defining complete response. Based on that accidental data, many groups, including, for example, the Dutch colleagues from Maastricht, um, conducted an international watch and wait database, which resulted in a lot of uh, observations about these patients experiencing this accidental response after actually only neoadjuvant treatments. Um, over 800 patients have been included and published in numerous publications. Very interesting that uh, if the people remained without regrowth for the first two years, then only a, a small minority would experience a regrowth after that. And even these recurrences of um, about 25% were mostly luminal. That means amendable to a good salvage surgery. 
that uh, led to very good results of five-year uh, disease-free survival of 94%. Recently, the group of Fernandez published data which show that after this accidental complete remission, um, the, uh, compared to the actuarial control rate of 70%, if for every additional year of uh, patients remaining tumor-free, both locally and in the case of disease, uh, distant metastasis free survival, the probability increased, increased significantly. That means, for example, in the green line, you see people remaining tumor free for three years and they sought only around two to 3% local regrowth in the next remaining years. The same was true for distant metastasis. The most important risk factors for regrowth were, of course, the P stage, as we would expect, but also a dose even smaller than 50.4 grade, which was the median for this patient cohort. Is it worth why we do this? Why we do what's in wait? Yes, we know in meanwhile there are enough data both for patient reported outcomes and objective uh, observations which saw a significant improvement in both, both functional and symptom scales, including body image and sexual function after what's in wait compared to TME. This led, of course, to intended organ preservation trials. And there are several concepts for that. We would start with the Greco, the French trial, which didn't change anything actually to the standard chemoradiotherapy, but had the idea to uh, avoid a radical excision for patients experiencing a complete response or near complete response with a residual tumor below two centimeters. These patients were then stratified uh, with then randomized, excuse me, and uh, to local excision versus TME, and all of the important endpoints, including tumor recurrence and death, and the primary endpoint, which was a composite of these end side effects, didn't differ statistically significant between the two arms. The major finding of this trial was intriguing. It was that the side effects and the major morbidities after both treatments were very similar, if you see here, but the devil is in the details because um, the local excision resulted in a much less rate of uh, severe adverse events, but the people who experienced a local regrowth and was amendable for a uh, salvage TME, they were the losers of this concept with side effects and major morbidities of 60 and 80% uh, respectively. The Danish trial followed a somewhat other concept. They escalated the radiotherapy to 60 uh, gray instead of 50 gray in the neoadjuvant treatment and an additional brachytherapy boost of five gray. Um, the chemotherapy remained the same and after six weeks, people with a complete remission would be followed up for a what's in weight strategy. Interestingly, the rate of local regrowth was exactly the same um, as in the retrospective data of the database that we have seen before. And overall, it succeeded that almost 60% of the patient had local tumor control only after chemoradiotherapy without surgery. But the rest of them, both these with the local regrowth and these with, without complete remission, had severe over-treatment. And you can see it after 18 months, we have more a grade two and three events as we would expect after a normal neoadjuvant treatment followed by uh, surgery. The last concept that has been evaluated in uh, recent years, you have seen from Professor Rodel's talk, it's the OPRA trial. I will not repeat now the concept, but it's a TNT, a total neoadjuvant concept where the chemotherapy was put before surgery and both arms, both this with upfront um, systemic treatment and this with upfront radiotherapy had relatively good disease-free survival, although they, didn't, uh, they did not achieve the goal of 85%, but the most interesting endpoint was the TME-free survival with much better results for the upfront radiotherapy. We could discuss what's the reason for that, but there could be many reasons from the longer interval from radiotherapy to surgery up to biological reasons, because we know from other um, tumor entities like anal cancer and head and neck cancer that upfront induction therapy might not uh, bring that what it promises due to, um, for example, um, reserving um, resistant tumor clones 
where, um, in, um, when avoiding an upfront local aggressive treatment. Uh, what's uh, the total concepts that we have in these years for organ preservation? How can we improve it? Here you see a summary um, above the standard radiotherapy or the radiochemotherapy, including also five times five concepts followed, uh, followed by a limited surgery for good responders, like in the French trial. Then the increased escalated radiotherapy, like in the Danish trial. Uh, most of the trials running or completed implemented brachytherapy for this reason, but there are also much modern techniques or combining techniques like simultaneous integrated boost. And finally, the intensified local treatment, like in the OPRO trial, including Folfox or Folfirinox upfront before surgery. And the future is in one way also in this intensified treatment, like in the German running trial that you have here. Uh, before, where the uh, complete response patients um, get a wedge and weight concept. I will not go in detail as you have here. It. Here is the dose again because some of you ask 54 grain. But also, monitoring the tumor response will help us selecting the right patient for this concept. Here you see a very good real life result of a diffusion weighted imaging above and how it correlates with a very good local tumor is response as it's evaluated endoscopically. So diffusion weighted MRI might be a useful tool for that, but we know we have many tools. Some of them are liquid biopsies. It's a very new field, especially in colorectal cancer, not tested for this indication, but I can recommend you a good review published in cancers for that, in colorectal cancer in general, but also radiomics like in the Dutch group or a diffusion weighted imaging, like I said before, but also clinical selection. So we have to include T2 patients, which we did not include it in the clear neoadjuvant treatment, at least not um, in recent years. Finally, if you have the right patient, you have uh, the different ways to go. Intensified TNT, for example, escalated radiation dose, also with means of modern MR guidance, for example, or maybe in the future as BRT. And uh, finally, a reduced extent of surgery, for example, local excision, or a combination of the above. These patients have to be closely followed up with multimodality treatment, including endoscopy, MRI imaging, and digital rectal examination for at least three years. After that, we have seen the rate of recurrences is low. This is no standard yet, but it should be offered in experienced centers after careful informed consent and complete remission because the uh, TME rates, free rates nowadays are uh, up to 60%. There are different strategies as we have seen, but careful, if there is a regrowth, there has to be a salvage TME. And these patients, the other losers, they are associated, uh, this is associated with an increased toxicity. The patient selection, including all tools that we have, both biological, like, like liquid biopsies as technical tools like uh, artificial intelligence and radiomics are crucial for the future improvements. At the end, I would like to thank Klaus Trudel for the teaching over the years and advice also for this talk and uh, most of all also the University Hospital Zurich colorectal team, Elena Garcia from Radiation Oncology, my colleague, but also the GI and the surgery, uh, med the medical oncology and the surgery GI team. Thank you very much. Thank you, Panos. Um, we are slightly over time, but we still have time for a few questions. One I would like to ask the both of you, which also refers to both the Hawks. How long can you wait before you do the surgical procedure? Is it half a year, the maximum? Could we even think of strategies which wait even longer? What would you say, Klaus? I, I did, the Rapido trial waited 24 weeks, right? And the Oprah trial, this is not uh, published yet, but it waited even longer. They waited uh, uh, 30, uh, 34 weeks uh, from the start of, of treatment. So this is a very, very long time. We don't know whether this is the way to go, but rem reminiscent to anal cancer, we have the 26 uh, 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 threshold to wait. And I think uh, rectal cancer now develops, uh, at least in subgroups, very similar to anal cancer. So as long as the tumor shrinks, in other, way, in, other way, in other words, 
you can wait. Uh, um, so I think this is, as Arno said, it is not a initial staging and, uh, anymore, but is a repetitive dynamic monitoring of tumor response that will enter our clinics, not only in studies, but also in routine. And as long as you see, like anal cancer, when there is no growing of the tumor, but a shrinking, you have, to, you have time, don't, don't panic as long as it sh shrinks. The, the, the problem in TNT is you have also to consider the other way around. If there is a tumor that progresses during treatment, you should not apply a TNT with nine cycles of Folfox and then go for surgery very, very late. Uh, you have to monitor the tumor during treatment. This was a discussion point in the Rapido trial as well. So we have to, these two concepts. Uh, you have to monitor to, uh, the tumor response, both for identification of the progressive tumors, and you should be, uh, you should remind yourself on anal cancer treatment, where you, when you see tumor shrinkage, then go on. There's a question by Dirk Böhmer also in this um, line. When or should we be afraid of increased fibrosis if we go for dose escalation um, of radiation percutaneously, brachytherapy, and also um, in terms of hyperfractionation? Are there any data of increased concerns um, when waiting longer in the context of dose escalation strategies? And might there be also a technical factor? There is a timing trial in the literature has been performed by Akila. Um, Garcia in the, in, in the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And this was a trial where they sequentially enlarged the time interval between treatment and surgery. And what they found is that there is a significant increase in fibrosis. Yeah, of course, as expected, but this did not translate into a higher rate of post-op complications. And so that we have to take the surgeon obviously also into account uh, I, I remember when we started with neoadjuvant radio chemotherapy, the surgeon were concerned that there is an increase in, in, in toxicity and in complications, but it turned out that this is not the case. And now with TNT, the surgeon will learn that there is more fibrosis, but they can adapt and they will not end up in a higher complications rate. This is what we have on data at the moment. Okay, I don't see any immediate or urgent questions and that's also um five minutes past six now so um it's a pleasure again um having you here thanks dirk um klaus we we discussed before that we would have loved to invite you for a dinner and enjoy the beautiful weather outside at the lake but um well that needs to be the next iteration of the session klaus many thanks for joining and sharing your expertise and um having you here in the discussion thank you very much before we leave, I would like um, to remind you of our next um, mini symposium, um, which will be in one week and will address the hyperfractionation in breast cancer. Um, and you are, of course, more than welcome of joining. Additionally, we will also store the questions which you have asked us and will um, try to send you the answers on a digital format, obviously. And also we will store the presentations and will make them available um, in a digital format. Thank you very much for joining. Everyone stay safe and happy to see you by next week. Bye everyone.